You've all seen Ron Conway here, and what I'm going to announce right now is that I'm running for mayor. <laughs> we could probably do it in this room. <laughs> I have to say, this has been um, a journey tonight that uh, only matches the journey that Susie and I have been on since Fort Thomas, Kentucky. And um, those little snippets were true. And uh, we have a thing in, in our family um, about getting together on a regular basis. And uh, uh, we have an idea that is built around family matters. And when we start talking about it, it sort of goes this way. Family matters. Family matters. Family matters. <laughs> and those are three very different ideas. And. Uh, what moves me about tonight is this room is very much a family to us. Um, I couldn't be more proud of what we have accomplished. And uh, most of it's been said. Um, but what I really want to tell you is that I feel like um, I have an inspiration that arises from what's been said tonight starting with George Schultz, that makes me feel like what I want to say is, this is the beginning, guys. It ain't over yet. <laughs> Which is to say there's still a lot to do. And uh, uh, the words from Wei Christensen in China, um, that story about Amherst is true. Um, she was a regulator at the SFC in Hong Kong, law degree from Columbia, and I got to tell you, she and Gokul Arroyo, who are now co-heads of Morgan Stanley in Asia, are a product of the time that we were all there together. And if the Morgan Stanley table here tonight could really tell the story, you'd hear some really fun stuff. Um, we worked hard, um, but we got a lot done. And one of the things that I, I learned in China is that uh, some of the mo most poignant uh, ideas um, come from stories. And I, I don't want to mention a bunch of names, but I can't tell you how happy I am that Mary Meeker is here tonight. Because we had our first internet deal in Asia. It was. Uh, the time when internet stocks were really starting to get hot. It was Asia Info, it was Cena.com, and I called Mary on the phone and I said, we need you out here because we've got some really good business coming along. She said, how big are they? I said, 25 million. She said, Jack, that's the fee I work on, not the deal size. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too busy, I can't come. Well, she called me in about 2005, and she said, I think China is getting hot. Could you set up a trip for me? I said, Mary, I'm too busy. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> the good thing is there's no open mic tonight. <laughs> um, the, the the family matters part of it is, is so important to me. And uh, we built a culture in Asia that was sort of around that idea, um, that we worked hard, that we had a lot of fun, and we made history. Those three things have sort of always been my philosophy, fun, money, and history. And, uh, you know, it's uh, very much what... Uh, Asia is about today. Um, I, um, I think I probably ought to say a couple of things about uh, philosophy. Um, Robin Wadsworth, who's sitting at the, wa uh, the Wadsworth table here, said, Gramps, are you going to be serious? You never are. <laughs> so I'm going to be serious for a minute. <laughs> um, I like to think about uh, 
the idea of guideposts. And when we were all together in Asia, particularly in Morgan Stanley before that, um, uh, we had some ideas about how the world worked. And um, the first guidepost is never confuse judgment with principle. Uh, Mr. Morgan said in testimony once uh, before the Senate that the future is hard to predict. We've all made lots of mistakes, but if I may speak for the firm that I'm proud to be the senior partner of, our mistakes have been mistakes of judgment, not mistakes of principle. And if there is anything that this world is about today that's important, it's not to forget the difference between those two. You bet. You bet 100% on principle, and if you do 51% on judgment, you're going to win the day. And uh, I actually learned those two ideas at the University of Chicago, and that's no kidding. The values that come out of a school that teaches theory and discipline and research is the kind of thing that instills that notion in you. Uh, the second point is teamwork and trust is a guiding principle. And it's a guiding principle in diplomacy, international relations, and in business. And uh, I will never forget my first trip, Elaine, up to Beijing to talk about teamwork and trust at CICC, our joint venture, when we were just putting together a very small team. And uh, I made my speech on teamwork and trust. And I ended by saying the most important concept about teamwork and trust is that you come to work every morning and you make your colleague look good. And I can tell you the looks on the faces around that table, these young Chinese said, Jack, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard in my life. And uh, it's no secret that in, in the Communist Party, you kind of start off with a, a different approach. You step on your neighbor and that's how you get ahead. Um, I'm hoping desperately that that is changing and I know we made a huge difference at CICC because the team eventually got it. I would say um, the two most important guiding principles in a world of risk like the world we have today are choose your counterparties and your team carefully and don't get over leveraged. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, you can do to avoid a crisis, but if you're wrong on either one of those, you'll get in trouble. And I remember we were having a long-term planning strategy session in Hong Kong, and uh, Gordon Richardson was the chairman of International at Morgan Stanley, a famous guy, head of the Bank of England, head of Schroeder's. Um, I called him a month before this meeting, and I said, J um, uh, I want you to come out and talk about how to think about running a business when the future is unknown. How do you accommodate the unknown future? And uh, he said, fine, he came out, the dinner came, uh, it was about five minutes before he was to speak, he came over to the table and he said, Jack, what did you ask me to talk about? <laughs> and that was Gordon Richardson. I mean, he wowed everybody in the room, you know, with stories about his career for 15 minutes. And then he said what I just said. Jack has asked me to talk about planning for the unknown. There are only two things you have to do right. Get good counterparties and don't get over leveraged. And if you think about the financial institutions or other businesses that have gone down, it usually is because they got one or both of those uh, wrong. Um, the fourth one is always, no matter what, have a plan B. Uh, everything I've ever done, um, it was always important to have a plan B in your back pocket because plan A doesn't always work. And uh, the only other thing I'd say about plan B is uh, don't go to plan B too soon, but don't go there too late. Um, five, seek to make a difference in your life. It's been you know, commented on a bunch of times. You know, we, we have one chance to go around, and uh, if somehow we don't make a difference along the way, it's not going to matter much. And uh, 
I must say it gives me pride and a lot of satisfaction to see so many of you in this room um, who I think are here in part because that's an idea that we all share. And uh, I think we have made a difference. And finally, I would say have fun, stay healthy, keep balance in your life, and stamina wins the long race. There's a guy named Perry, Perry Hall, who was one of the founding partners of Morgan Stanley. And when he retired, he was re interviewed by the New York Times. And the New York Times said, Mr. Perry, what is it that has been the key to your success? He said, stamina. The reporter said, what's next? He said, stamina. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that's it. <laughs> it is stamina. So that's sort of the life according to Jack and, and guideposts. And I would have to say that, uh, um, you know, these are written down on a piece of paper in Asia someplace. I'm sure you guys at the Morgan Stanley table remember them. Now, I want to say one thing about the Asia Society. Everything is said that could be said, but uh, Susie and I started our devotion and relationship with the Asia Society in Hong Kong, interestingly enough. And it happened for one reason, and I think this is one of the important stories about the Asia Society as a place. The first director of the Asia Society was 1989, and first of all, as Bob Oxnam remembers, this was a group of leaders in Hong Kong who wanted to show the world that an important organization would have the confidence to open up an office in Hong Kong after Tiananmen Square. And the two guiding lights were Charles Lee and Q.W. Lee, uh, two really amazing people in Hong Kong. But the first director was a man named Bert Levin. And Bert Levin was a career foreign service officer. His last post was Myanmar. And I met him. And curiously enough, his scholarly expertise was China. He knew more about China than anybody I have ever met. And he was fluent in Mandarin. And I would say his life was one of those uh, you know, minor disappointments as he thought about his career because he never got to be ambassador to China. That's what he really wanted to be. But he was in Hong Kong, and I met him. And uh, I said, Bert, I'm going to have to have a China strategy for Morgan Stanley. Our first paper said, we can get every country in Asia right. But if we get China wrong, we'll fail. That was 1990. And uh, Bert said, OK, I'll make you a deal. I'll have lunch with you once a month, and I'll tell you everything I know about China if you will do anything I asked you to do for the Asia Society. And I'm still paying. <laughs> that was a bloody expensive lunch. <laughs> but a good one. <laughs> Okay, so I want to, um, I want to go to the, um, to the wrap up. And the wrap up is kind of this, uh, in the spirit that family matters, um, we are prepared to make choices in our lives. Um, and we're prepared by family, we're prepared by mentors, we're prepared by our education. But I would say, upon reflection and hindsight, the most important decisions that you make in your life uh, are maybe seven or eight. I mean, it's not a 100, because there are just not many things that come along that I would say are really important. And so you get prepared to make those decisions. and. In closing, I want to talk about my mother and father, because that's one decision you don't get to make. <laughs> I think that's a fact. <laughs> Fort Thomas, Kentucky is the Midwest part of the United States. And uh, our family was always in the manufacturing business. Uh, our family made things. And so when I told my dad that I was going to use my education to become an investment banker in Wall Street, 
He wasn't very happy, to be honest. He said, here in the Midwest, we make things. Investment bankers are parasites. <laughs> well, we had a family business, and the family business was still going. Um, and it was curious to me that I had to be in Wall Street for about almost 15 years before Dad would invite me to join the board of the family company. Uh, since I had sold out to the opposition and the Eastern establishment, I just wasn't worthy of being on the board of a manufacturing company. Uh, so I did. The other uh, view that he had, he really didn't like Eastern liberals much. He was a fairly conservative guy, and he saw California as another country and really just a place in trouble. So he said to me, um, just bear this in mind. America would be a better place if California and New York were cut adrift. <laughs> well, he really believed that. And uh, God, I loved him so much, no matter what he said or thought, and we all know this, no matter what happened, uh, whether it was good or bad, uh, his telephone number was always my first call. Um, he had three one-liners. Dad was the master of the one-liner. The first one was, never let your desires make your decisions. Well, he violated that principle try twice because I have a sister. <laughs> you got that. <laughs> But what he didn't know, and what I've discovered since I've been in Asia, is that he was a Buddhist. That's a Buddhist idea, right? Just never let your desires get too far ahead of you. The second one was, observe the turtle because he makes progress only when his neck is out. And Dad had a cartoon of a turtle in his office. And uh, when he retired from Littleford Brothers, which was the family company, he sent it to me, and the note said, your turn, son. <laughs> and that's probably the story of why we're all here together. His third one was, results matter, excuses don't count. And this is kind of, um, you know, I, Lee Kuan Yew was a person I admired, just like George. And uh, I talked to some of his colleagues after he passed away. And uh, I said, what is it like without the old man around? And um, uh, this is Go Chuck Tong. He said, uh, he said Jack, uh, the old man was a visionary. And there are two kinds of visionaries. They're dreamers, and they're the visionaries that don't take no for an answer. <laughs> that was Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, I think that's what my, my old man met, meant when he said that. So in absolute closing, I want to say that as we celebrate 20 years of the Asia Society in Northern California and this night, I would say we can all be happy that this defines success in a way that makes me very proud. However, my mother was the wise one in the family, and she always told us when you're at a party like this, when you say goodbye, leave. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>